life in the everyday, when it's hard, can be so dull and such a tough slog that for them, that sense of joy and being alive is so infectious. But there's also a kind of an underlying truth to it that you can't get away from, that you feel you could actually turn down a street and knock on a door and meet this family. We know that they're out there. And I love the idea of if you're poor and you're struggling and you feel shame on top of it, it's worse. That there's something about being shameless that's freeing. Andrew Stern, who I work with, uh, had said there's this guy in London that you really have to meet named Paul Abbey. He's done this show called Clocking Off. This is seven years ago. I was meeting with Paul Abbott about another project that he had done. And he said to me at the time, that's a really great project, but I just finished this other one that hasn't aired yet. Uh, you should take a look at it. It's called Shameless. My inspiration for, uh, for the whole series comes from my own family. My 16-year-old sister brought up, um, we were eight kids. Uh, and no parents, and she brought us up. She was pregnant, by the way. She was about nine months pregnant at 16. And we didn't know what we looked like from the outside. So there's a real spirit to the way we live. I grew up in uh, Colorado in an area where there was a lot of, uh, there were a lot of people who were kind of struggling, and, and uh, we weren't struggling in my family, but we knew a lot of people who were, and that reminds me of the bunch of the families that I grew up around. I think one of the main reasons it went to John wasn't because he was the highest bidder. I think he was the lowest, but actually the humanity the bloke's got for knowing what that series, the glue for the series is. It was the tone, it was the wackiness, and I didn't think it was on television in America. And, uh, you know, six and a half short years later, we actually got it produced. We, uh, we took it to a number of different networks in the United States, and everybody was afraid of it. It's very body. And then eventually Showtime uh, stepped up and said, you know what, we, we would love to do this. I was familiar with Mark Mylott's work, and his agent called me up and said, you know, you know Mark and know of his work, and you haven't worked together, but he's great. And what you don't know is that he directed the original version of Shameless on British television. I just came in really with no expectation and just said my piece about what I loved about it and what I'd love to do and this challenge of, you know, creating the American version. And uh, they must have taken pity on me because they gave me the gig, you know. <laughs> Mark came in and knew the show inside out and the characters inside out. And we talked stylistically about what I wanted to do and it was exactly what he wanted to do. And then we went out and just had a blast. Burgers coming through. Uh, what, napkins? I worried about how the translation would be able to absorb that, that level of uh, humanity and the wit of the characters we created, not because that doesn't exist in American culture, but it, it comes from a different frequency. The thing we wanted to embrace was how, despite any obstacles, this family was a family, and they would do anything for each other. And the whole idea that they work as a unit, and even though they might not have money, they have each other, and they love each other, and, you know, that's how, in America, that's the whole basis of our country, is that togetherness. Absorbing the American culture has just been done by stunning writing. Tiny, microscopic levels of uh, syntax change, and, you know, and semantics. Talk out of your ass with that much conviction, you end up needing a much bigger toothbrush. That's a uh, anal fact. There are elements to the British version which have kind of verged on the misanthropic, and there's almost a, almost a kind of, uh, a kind of delight, a knowing delight in, in that. The American version is, is slightly warmer in tone. And a round for all my friends from the UAW. Wow. Really? Fuck no. We wanted it to show real America, what the greater part of our population experiences in life and the struggles and the hardships and the way that real Americans survive. Most soap operas are blue collar and we pretend that's the lowest scale of social organism there is, but, you know, never mind blue collar, white collar, we were no collar. <laughs> but you don't see sophisticated drama being rendered around that landscape. The series at its best has the audience thinking these people don't have two dimes to rub together, but I really want to hang out with them. The shooting style of the show is really raw, it's really fast. Um, we try to make people feel like they're in the family, in the show, in the kitchen in the morning, or, you know, in the car with us. It comes from putting the camera in the room on a certain lens that kind of reflects 
a, a, a dizzy visitor um, in that crazy world and doesn't stand back and doesn't judge as a more telescopic lens might do. The camera moves a lot. And it's not just one still, here's your close-up. There's one over here, one over here, one up there. There's a lot of like handheld uh, camera work that's done. It's kind of like they cover one side, they cover the other side, and then they catch everything else uh, handheld. It's uh, quite amazing seeing how our crew can keep up with us because it's, uh, it's, it's truly pandemonium in, in, in some scenes. I like the chaotic, you know, shoot it, move around, DP's all over the place, quick lighting, because it's real. You know, we're at the Alibi Bar right now, and it's like a real Midwest bar. I mean, am I right? Isn't this a cool bar? They're almost like a fly on the wall. So it's almost like a reality show where they just put cameras up, and so it follows you around. It's like that. You don't get a break. It's, it's, like, it's like theater almost. You're constantly on, you're constantly reacting, you know. At any moment, a camera could be on you and you don't want to be caught with your pants down, you know. You always got to be ready because you never know when the DP is going to flip and shoot the camera and be, you know, watching what you're doing. So everything is really spontaneous. You never know where they're hiding a camera. Here, you got to be a little careful. There's three cameras running, and so they may be shooting what a would pass as a master at the same time they're shooting your close-up and it means two things one you got to ask is this my hero shot and two you just got to make sure you're good all the time the manic energy that is inherent within this family is inherent within the actors we get there there's not a lot of rehearsal we all kind of bond together we're like okay we're gonna get this done and we do it and somehow it magically works um, and we encourage the messy nature of it they tell the cast and crew, basically, to just let everyone go crazy, never pull anyone back. They want us to have this energy and constantly be ramping us up. In between takes, quite often, we'll be so loud and kind of obnoxious that it'll be hard for, like, the camera guys and the sound, and, like, the whole crew to kind of get the scene together and everything. And I know that that kind of bugs them, but uh, we all kind of are, are very thankful that they don't, you know, freak out on us or anything like that. The, the problem with that more spontaneous style is that if one isn't careful, it can just become chaotic and off-putting and that the audience become, you know, dizzy or, or confused. And the challenge is to create a kind of orchestrated chaos. It's fun to work fast and it's fun to not get too laborious about something and make it, you know, tedious. You want to have it be an enjoyable experience. I think we shot 11 and a half pages one day, and that was a 12-hour day, which is a normal work day. I've shot eight or 10 pages before, but it went to 14, 16 hours. This is a, a wonderfully well-conceived machine. Really, the directorial staff and, and producing staff are just lazy. That's why I just do two takes. They're all amateurs. I don't know if you read, read the list, but a lot of these people haven't done anything. John Wells? I don't know. Up and comer. Chicago was picked because it was such a great kind of mirror of Manchester, which was the original British location. Um, it, it's, a, it's a very much a blue collar working class city with a real pride and a real heartbeat. To me, it's always felt like the uh, political, geographical, and social center of the country. It's right there in the middle. It ain't New York and it ain't LA. It's something different. In the lower class community in Chicago, it's much more of a melting pot. So it represents a better range of America because there's all different nationalities in that, the area that we picked in Chicago. It's a working town. I've heard if you can't get a job anywhere else, go to Chicago, you can get a job. It's right there smack in the middle of the Rust Belt where manufacturing has fallen apart. Strangely, the weather <laughs> is important. It's a, a brutal, long winter, and uh, it does things to people. They honker down. There's a storm coming in Chicago. It's a twister. It's a twister. It's a big old white <laughs> coming in North Chicago. And for some reason, that just seems to work for this show, that it's a hostile environment once you walk out that door. There is a lot of struggle, especially in, in, you know, some of the lower income parts 
and I think we're capturing an area that not a lot of people are really familiar with. We went to this, what was told was a very high crime neighborhood, a very low income, one of the poorest neighborhoods in the country, and found nothing but really lovely, welcoming, warm people. And I don't mean to be patronizing about that at all, which is always a risk when, you know, media people make programs about poor people. But there was a genuine heart to this neighborhood, which was unmistakable. Chicagoans, you know, they have a lot of confidence, you know, in, in different forms and they enjoy their food, and they enjoy their alcohol, and they enjoy their family. Just hanging out with a lot of Chicago people, you start developing uh, the feel of, of, you know, someone who's grown up in a little bit of a tougher area or from the Midwest. I think everything comes to life a little more, and it's a little more real in Chicago. If I had it my way, we would, we would shoot everything in Chicago. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. What I like the most about working on a show where no subject is taboo is that no subject is taboo. <laughs> it can be a little frightening at times to have a series where there's no, there's no boundaries. It's very frank sexually. Um, the language is very frank to the neighborhood and real to the neighborhoods and the way that people speak. Fuck you. I love you too. There is drug use, there is alcoholism. Nobody has actually written characters like this. We've seen how weird humans can be and how shameless they can be, but somebody put thoughts down and wrote this down. I just feel free. I feel free to write whatever I want and to explore and to share some of my own personal stories through these characters. One feels that it's a genuine exploration of human nature and that it's not edited through the prism of television. It's actually, one can be so much more honest about, you know, the, the most pure and the most base instincts of human behavior. Hey, what's urine and Canadian beer have in common? They both come from pussies. I mean, some of the scenes I have to be exposed to stuff. Nothing, you know, bad, bad, but bad words and stuff. I know it's wrong not to do or say that stuff. I know what it all means and everything, so, yeah. We could go actually really deeper of what people are going through. Because, you know, the stories are endless. Especially nowadays, man, people are struggling out there. Being able to do things that you feel are realistic and stay true to those characters without having people tell you what you can or can't do is fantastic. It doesn't help if you have nothing to say, <laughs> but if you're actually saying something that's free to be as real as you can make it, it's very exciting. May you always only have two testicles between you. Look at him! The combination of the raciness of the script, multiple cameras, a big cast, three plots running, makes this a hybrid. I don't think I've ever seen it. It's nothing like I've ever seen on American TV but it was nothing like I'd ever seen on British TV, and I still don't quite know what it is, and I hope I never fully find out. And it hits the notes of things that I like to do, which is to make things funny and at the same time poignant. It's also a bit outrageous. It's not on television anywhere, on American television. And I think the American audience is ready for it.